Welcome to Shoreside, the Coastal Resilience Podcast and the most resilient podcast in the world. Funded by the Department of Homeland Security and broadcasting out of beautiful Chapel Hill, North Carolina, we speak with the undisputed experts in coastal resilience. Bruce Rosenblum, back with you. It's been too long since we last spoke. I know, I know, I did not mean to keep you waiting. It's just We've been so busy over here hosting events, doing projects, and putting out, of course, the hottest content in the coastal resilience realm. And we actually dropped a very, very nice video recently on Ironton, Louisiana. Now, look, the world needs to know about this community. Watch the video to find out why. Link in the description. It's all part of serious resilience research being done by Dr. Cassandra R. Davis. We also have content dropping soon on our disasters and equity workshop that we did. Huge, huge event, extremely important because CRC is in fact at the intersection of social science and disaster recovery. We are bridging the gap thanks to DHS and some very, very smart people. And speaking of smart people and bridging that gap, our next guest is one of the most prime policy scholars to be working with minority-serving institutions. She's connected countless students to the coastal resilience needs of community partners while doing her own research on how we can help the entire world understand the looming impact of sea level rise. Chatting with us from Old Dominion University, we are officially welcoming Dr. We Yusuf. Dr. Yusuf, happy spring. How are you? Happy spring, Bruce. I'm doing great. And it's a stormy day in Norfolk, Virginia, but I'm pleased to be here with you. How's the pollen out there? Oh, the pollen, of course. Uh, (laughs) It's what makes life exciting and challenging. I tell you, it's it's yellow over here. A lot of that stuff flying around, but uh, it's nice that we are moving into the springtime here because it's the most beautiful time of year, right? But look, I need to point this out for our listeners before we get started here. 28 peer-reviewed journal articles in the past five years, $1.5 million in research grants, two edited books, not one, but two. This is you. Uh, We, first question, how on earth do you manage this kind of output and how can the rest of us get on your level? Well, I think you have to love what you do and you have to love the topic that you study. But more importantly, you really have to work with amazing people and you have to have a team. And I have an amazing team here at ODU, um, at other partner institutions, and by working together in the same way that communities can work together to build their resilience and to address all kinds of issues on the ground, my multidisciplinary team, we work together to do research that has this impact. And so it's not, it is work, of course, but it's fun work when you're working with people that you want to work with and you know that the work that you're doing is making a difference on the ground. Very true. And you've got some real heavy hitters there at ODU. We'll talk about them later on uh, as the conversation evolves. But right now, I just want to jump right into this. And that means we got to go back, back to 2021, At the very end of one of the most active hurricane seasons in history, back then a big book dropped called Communicating Climate Change, Making Environmental Messaging Accessible. And you had a real big role in this. Tell us about it. So we were really excited about writing this book because one of the challenges Um, that we've had. So I put on my Virginia Sea Grant extension hat and we do a lot of work with community members, with nonprofit organizations and helping them realize or understand the challenges that come with sea sea level rise and climate change more broadly. And in a lot of instances, it's not for their lack of interest in the topic, but it's really that sometimes the material that is available to them is very dense. Or unfortunately, we do science talk at people rather than to and with people. And so that was really the major thrust of this book is how do we make the messaging about climate change, about environmental issues accessible? And it's not just that the information is available, but accessible really means that it's relevant to them, that it's understandable, that they can connect with it. Um, And so that was really the thrust. So we were really excited to, to kind of get this book project going and really working on 
um, topics and issues that were not esoteric, you know, research for research sake, but really um, highlighting work on the ground. So one book chapter that, that I particularly enjoy in that book is about participatory mapping and crowdsourcing and really how your average resident on the street can be part of a data collection effort that can then be used to actually figure out are our civilized models right on track or do they need to be adjusted based on real world data? And so this participatory mapping, um, I think, is a really good way to get people to understand the severity of the problem, but also be part of documenting uh, the problem itself and be part of then um, how we might ground truth models um, so that scientists and modelers aren't making these models in, you know, off in their laboratories or on their super duper fancy computers. Um, but really that we're ground truthing them with where's the water on, on the ground. And, and so, for example, so that was one way that we can make this message about, yes, the water is rising. And you can know that and you can be part of the effort to collect where that information, where that water is rising and how do we document it? Um, so those are the kinds of chapters that we have in the book. And so my co-author, my co-editor and I, and then obviously the co-authors in the different book chapters really wanted to hone in on that messaging that we can do great science, we can do great research, but how then do we translate it in a way that everybody else can understand it and then take action and use that information in decision-making or um, in policy-making? So, yeah. I love this. And as a communicator myself, I can dig the participatory vibe that you're putting out here. It's all about taking what's complex and trying to make it simple because people need to understand what's at stake and what's happening here. And also, we can all play an active role in what's going on. I think that's, what's, that's what we're all getting at here. So with that in mind, how do you make that message accessible and how do you include the people and get people to care about this stuff? So I think the big challenge is getting away from talking at people and talking with them. And when I first really kind of got engaged in um, Virginia Sea Grant Extension, one of the hardest, that was one of the biggest challenges that I faced because it also happened right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so how do you engage with people? So I was attending, for example, civic league meetings via Zoom. I talked to master gardeners in our local area about the work that I do, about sea level rise and the impact of um, saltwater intrusion, for example. But trying to engage with people via Zoom was its own, <laughs> was its own difficult beast. Uh, so I think part of it is how do you talk with people in a conversation? Um, and stepping away from, for example, the lecture approach, where you have all these amazing, beautiful slides, um, but it's not interactive and it's not it's not engaging. Um, I think the other part is getting people to understand that they have a stake in the conversation and that this conversation is, is relevant to them. Um, I have another hat. And then this other hat, I do work on fiscal policy and uh, really transparency of financial information. And when you talk to people about taxes, sometimes either they get really upset or their eyes kind of just glaze <laughs> over. Um, but but again, this is an issue that affects every person who pays taxes or pays fees. And so again, there my research looks at how do you connect people to this information in a way that they can use this information to better make decisions. Talking with people and not at them. I love that. and. It's one of the reasons why we do this podcast. It's to show the human side of these sometimes very technical issues. Because, boy, you know as well as I do, they can get extremely technical. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can strip away the details and, and show the, the real soul of what's going on here. And I think you managed to do that very well over the course of your career. And what a career it's been. You've been at this for so many years and particularly uh, – talking about how people feel about this stuff. Let's for a moment go back to 2014. Old Dominion mm -hmm. University, Norfolk, Virginia. 2014, you're giving a talk to students on some very, very important topics. What can you tell us about the role of politics and proximity in sea level rise policy salience? So this is a really interesting topic because the roots of this conversation 
um, goes back to this idea of why do we not in Virginia have policies that address sea level rise? Hmm. And part of the challenge is really that when you're talking about a problem like sea level rise, like flooding that only affects part of the state, it's hard to get traction and salience when you have legislators maybe from mountainous parts of the state or other parts of the state that have very different types of concerns and don't have to worry about coastal hazards. Um, and so how do you balance? So the issue then is that proximity of the legislators whose constituencies are dealing with that problem need to also balance out with the needs of legislators whose constituencies might be more worried about agriculture or might be worried about landslides. Um, and so we found that legislative support for policymaking that address sea level rise is basically connected to how far you are or how close you are to the problem itself. Mm. Um, so that, that I think is kind of part of the challenge with trying to get policymaking at a state level when there are parts of the state that are not affected by that particular problem. Uh, right. The other part that I would that that I would emphasize in, in talking to the students about this issue is also that a challenge with trying to get state level policy when it comes to sea level rise and and um, flooding is also that there are different perceptions about who ultimately is responsible. Is it the federal government? Is it the state government? Is it the local authorities? And when there's not agreement on who is ultimately responsible, it's very easy not to say that they do it, but it's very easy to pass the buck for the locality to say, well, that's the state's responsibility or for the state to say, oh, but this these are local problems and the localities should address it. And ultimately, for a lot of our residents to say, if there's a disaster and a hurricane hits, the federal government is going to come provide me with federal assistance that is going to bail me out. Um, so without, I think, consistent uh, understanding of who should be responsible and who should be leading action when it comes to sea level rise, it's hard for um, this research was looking at state legislators. It's hard to say that the state should be implementing policies at the state level when you have to kind of trade all of those different responsibilities. Talking about passing the buck, this reminds me of the East Palestine train incident that was catastrophic. And when that happened, everybody thought, well, who is responsible for fixing this? Is it the feds? Is it the state? And of course, there's so many protocols and rules. And a lot of times, I think we get so mixed up in those rules and policies, we forget there's an incident that we all need to cover down on and, and try to fix. Now, of course, sea level rise, it seems like what you said, coastal societies and coastal cities they're more apt to care about it uh, because it affects them. But isn't this going to affect all of us eventually? Ultimately, I think climate change affects everyone. And while we might think about sea level rise as a problem that only coastal communities are experiencing, the fact that we have coastal squeeze where, you know, your coast is being squeezed on one end by sea level rise mm -hmm. and by development on the other end also means that those who are caught in, the, in between might have to eventually take on some drastic changes. And so we've all heard uh, different terms like managed retreat. Oh, uh, yes. Relocation, strategic retreat. Uh. Um, and, and so I think though in some communities, though, and we've seen that it has actually been inevitable in some communities. Mm -hmm. um, but then the impact of that is people will move inland and so you also have to think about what will be the impact on receiving communities. Right. We see this with, for example, disasters. We saw this with Katrina, where you saw a dispersion of your population and you had a t all of these different receiving communities. Some were taking maybe a few families, others were taking a lot of families, but it then has an impact on the infrastructure of the receiving communities. It has an impact on the population, the, the economy. Uh, so nobody, I think, is necessarily spared from this. Maybe uh, you experience the impacts in different ways. Um, but even just bigger picture, thinking about climate change, nobody's really spared from it. In other words, then we're all connected. No one is in a vacuum when it comes to disasters. It's going to affect everybody across the board at some point, somehow. Mm. 
it's got to be tough for you because you have advised multiple sets of governments on this stuff. And of course, lawmakers, they often have their plates totally full with issues. How do you get them to care about this issue in the context of everything else they got to deal with? I think the easiest way to talk about these issues is in the context of mandated planning. So, for example, at the local level, we might have localities that have to undertake comprehensive planning. And that might only come every 10 years, but it's a comprehensive long term analysis of where they want to develop, where the population might be moving to, where should infrastructure be located. And it, and and so there's a, so we call this mainstreaming where you're taking sea level rise and climate policies and kind of inserting them into existing mechanisms and in, in and existing planning planning approaches. Um, but I think by not really kind of making the big ripple, you can make easier uh, entry into these types of, of changes. So for example, at the local level, comprehensive planning and thinking about what are the impacts of sea level rise on your community and how that changes where you need to be placing infrastructure. Um, at a state level, um, more recently, we've dealt with some of this through the Commonwealth of Virginia has a mitigation plan update. And they're really thinking about the vulnerability of populations, the impacts of sea level rise, the impacts of climate change more broadly. And then more importantly, what is the capacity of the state government uh, to mitigate some of those hazards up front, not just, you know, responding during an event or, God forbid, recovery after after that. So really thinking about capacity up front uh, to undertake mitigation. So I think uh, that those are usually the easier forays into doing this is through existing uh, mechanisms. The challenge, though, is that we're also kind of in this situation where we're also recognizing that these business as usual incremental approaches to adaptation that we've we've all been doing, raising houses, raising roads, uh, beach nourishment, replenishment, sand replenishment. Uh, these are incremental adaptations, business as usual. We've been doing them and we know they're effective, but they might not be effective in the long run. Right. So in some cases, this, there's this idea that we might need to move beyond incremental adaptation and really think about transformative adaptation and transformative solutions to dealing with issues like sea level rise in the longer term. Ooh, and now we're drifting into Dr. Gavin Smith's territory, managed retreats. You know, how do we get ahead of things? But I like the term you use mainstreaming because it seems like there's been a bit of a shift now and governments at all levels. They're starting to take this stuff pretty seriously. and They're starting to really realize, hey, we have to do certain things to preserve what we have in, in, the, in the long term. And there are a lot of different threats in, in this context. And, and we all know, I mean, speaking of another threat, rust. Rust is one of the biggest blights across America, you know, our dying industrial sector. It's called the Rust Belt for a reason, major problem. But there's there's something very similar to that taking place that doesn't get nearly as much attention. Saltwater intrusion. What can you tell us about saltwater intrusion and also the Coastal Futures Hub? So the Coastal Futures Hub is an NSF co coastlines and peoples. A uh, project that is being led out of the University of Virginia, and it's uh, really working on the eastern shore of Virginia within the communities and with the communities um, to develop an equity atlas to help them with addressing climate equity over the long term. Um, it's a five year project. I think we're in year three um, of of the project. And it's, it's very much this idea that solutions for the community have to be co-produced with the community and led by the community. Um, anybody who's worked um, on in applied projects or in the community have heard the challenges that come up when communities perceive researchers to come in and parachute into the community, use them as research subjects, and then parachute out and, and leave the community uh, be feeling like they're being taken advantage of or that they got nothing out of that experience. And we're and, and here we have a group of community leaders um, that are kind of taking the charge and helping shape the direction. So it's not researchers coming in and say, this is what you need to do to address sea level rise and to address flooding and saltwater intrusion. But this is really what 
the community is is needing. And so more recently in February, we had a, an annual community meeting and I had one station with one of my research colleagues from UVA. And what we were trying to do was uh, develop a stakeholder model of all of the different entities that were being involved in climate and equity work on the Eastern shore. Um, the idea being that in a lot of instances, there are so many different entities that are working in the space, but we don't necessarily know how they're connected and how they're working together. But also more importantly, we also know that it's very hard to reach out to everybody. So this is a Virginia Sea Guard extension person in me thinking, how do I get out into the community? And it's very hard to reach every everybody and every organization. But by mapping the stakeholder network, we can actually identify which organizations might be at the center or at the hub of this network through which we can maybe do more targeted work with them and get the information out, disseminated out through kind of these hub organizations. So you might reach out to one organization, but then be able to disseminate to a much wider range of entities and, and organizations. So we developed kind of a preliminary stakeholder model based on some of the work that we did. But at this community meeting, we had residents, um, members of nonprofits, um, local governments, and we basically said, help, help us out. You work in this space, you know what this community landscape looks like. Who are we missing in our stakeholder network? What are the relationships that we're not mapping out here? And so we really wanted to get the community invested in providing that information. To also, in the, same, in the same way that we were trying to do with the participatory mapping, try to ground truth our stakeholder model and figure out what are the pieces that are missing. Uh, and I think that's really important. You can't develop these research products in isolation and then hand it off to the community and say, oh, here it is. You really do need to figure out how it can be beneficial to them and then develop it in a way with them or with their input to make sure that, again, it's accessible, it's relevant, it meets their need, it's understandable. So it's a fun project. We, we still have a ways to go, but I do feel like the big thrust of the project currently is still really working with the community. It's a big part of any project that would that wants to have an impact. You do have to work with the community. Agree. Totally. In other words, you try to step outside of academia in a, in a cloistered academic environment and get everybody on board, create a network of all groups that have a stake in this problem so that everybody can cross talk and get things done. Yes, but I think the other part, Ruth, and, and you know, you talked about using this podcast to kind of bring the research uh, to the people. But it's also, I think, an important venue for us to, to also let people know that researchers are people, too. Right. And we can connect with you in the same way that you connect with your neighbors. We're not, you know, sometimes we do. And, and I don't get me wrong. I love going to these big lectures and giving lectures and have 100 people listen to me. But but we also do have these smaller group interactions are also um, a, a lot of fun. Um, here at ODU, we have something that we call Science Pub. And it's a very informal uh, way to bring science and research and the researchers themselves out to the community. So we might go to a brewery and have a small, you know, no presentations, no slides, just the researcher. And, you know, you get to, you, you know, you just over over drinks and just have a conversation with the researcher on whatever topic it is of of choice for that night. So I think Science Pub is another way um, that I think ODU has been very successful in bringing this information out and getting it to, into the hands of people who are impacted or who could be making decisions about it. What a wonderful idea, Science Pub. Has the turnout been good at these events? Um, the ones that I've been to, we've had about 20 to 25 people in some in some instances, <laughs> you know, you when you go, you do hand out tickets for a free drink. So I think there is some enticement. <laughs> um, and actually this week, um, our graduate students, uh, this week is Science Pub for our graduate students, and they'll be doing their lightning talks at the Science Pub to kind of give short talks about their research. Again, no PowerPoints, it's just, you know, small group communication about, about your research. Now, uh would you like to go ahead and plug this? What 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 bar are you going to? 
Do you know? If you don't know, it's okay. Child, we can... I might get into trouble if they run out of drink tickets. Uh, that's right, because we're broadcasting <laughs> to the world here. It's okay. We'll uh, we'll see if we can put the link in the description and, and follow up on that so that people know that, yes, they can talk with uh, the leading researchers on this stuff in a very relaxed and fun environment. That What a great idea. And it's it's true. What you say is is very true. We're all humans. doesn't matter what you do or where you come from. There's a... There's a kinship here, and we're all trying to move in, in in similar directions. So breaking down barriers, that's what we're all about here at the CRC and Old Dominion and uh, everywhere, every facet of this community. It's all about this. And it's it all plays into the, the need to help coastal communities, help the world. You're all about this. I love it. And talking about, you know, the, the hub and the things you've developed, you also develop something else to help address the needs of coastal communities. What can you tell us about the Resilience Adaptation Feasibility Tool? So the Resilience Adaptation Feasibility Tool, or the RAFT, um, a great acronym, by the way, um, but it's, it's, it's an approach that helps, that takes university partners like myself, um, the other partners are the University of Virginia and Virginia Tech, um, and we go out and we actually work with communities to support their resilience planning. So the raft has three phases. The first is an actual assessment of the community's resilience. And it might be a quantitative assessment via the raft scorecard. But we also know that you can't capture everything with numbers. And so we also do a qualitative assessment by talking to people in the community about what does resilience mean? What are the resilience challenges? Um, in that community. So that's the first step is to kind of get an idea of where the community stands. So post-assessment, the second step of the raft is to bring the community together in a community workshop. And there again, it's about kind of from the bottom up, having community members who are part of this workshop identify what are the things that we can do that we can put on a resilience action checklist that can really kind of get us moving forward and addressing the resilience of our community. Um, so it's part discussion, it's part prioritization, but the result of that workshop is a resilience action checklist that can help the community guide its resilience planning in the future. Um, but I think the bigger, what, what, what the best thing about the raft that I love the most is that we don't just stop there. We actually spend 12 months, a year, with the community and we put together implementation teams and work with these implementation teams over this year long period to help them actually undertake projects that are on the resilience action checklist. We know that we can't get everything done in a year, but I think Bruce, one of the big challenges is kind of inertia. And so if you can start on small projects and get things done over a year, hopefully you can also kind of build momentum and move the needle, even if it's slightly forward, in longer term resilience. So that 12 months um, is really where you get your hands dirty and you're supporting these communities doing the work. One of my favorite raft implementation projects is a project that my colleague here at ODU, Tom Allen, um, had done for uh, Colonial Beach, one of the towns, uh, one of the more rural towns in, in Virginia. And they had some coastal erosion problems on their beach. And he took up the high drone, which is this drone, but for water. Yeah. Um, and they used it to actually kind of map coastal erosion for the community and, and give them a better idea of how, you know, how bad erosion is in different parts of, of their coastline. Um, we did that for free as part of supporting the implementation. So they had the data to help them with kind of subsequent planning um, for managing coastal erosion. Uh, so, you know, it was a great opportunity for Tom, uh, for Tom Allen to go out and test his hydro and work in the community, but also produce something that communities, that the community could, could benefit from. So again, we do it to support the community, but also in a way that synergistically also leverages university expertise that the, that the community might not have. And, benefiting the university partner. In this way, Tom Allen was able to kind of test a protocol for how the hydrone could be used, test it in one community, 
document it. And now it's something that he can use in other communities. So it works, you know, it works out um, both ways. So I think uh, I kind of digressed, but the raft is really helping communities with this resilience planning. Um, but more importantly, it's not just about resilience to hazard, but it's really about economic resilience and social resilience and thinking about equity throughout the resilience planning process. And I love how you do it for a year. You spend a year with each community and you look at the problem through, through a holistic lens, because like you said, that communicates that you're you're there to stay. You're not just there for a month or two just to get some data and and head off. You've got a stake in the outcome here. And uh, that's I, I would imagine that goes a long way toward establishing goodwill with these communities. And I believe uh, you uh, help some tribal communities as well. Is that right? So um, I'm part of a team that has worked with some of the Virginia tribes with with some of their resilience planning, uh, thanks to grant funding from the National Hazard Center. Um, Nicole Hutton, who is my colleague here at ODU in the Department of Geography and in our Institute for Coastal Adaptation and Resilience, has really kind of taken the lead. Um, and we actually used the raft as a starting point for that, recognizing that we developed a raft for localities and that recognizing that Virginia tribes have very unique governance structures and their own very unique needs, uh, try to adapt the raft to very to address kind of those particular needs. And what would you say? What do you think the outcome is for this stuff? Is it looking good? Are, are, are we making a difference here with this raft program? I would like to say so. <laughs> but, I, but I will also say that I think. Um, while we've worked with these communities for a year, uh, and we're able to do that because we have funding from local foundations, we have funding from, um, we used to get funding from Virginia Sea Grant, we had funding from the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. But once that year is done, sometimes the communities struggle to maintain that momentum because they don't have the resources. Again, we're talking in a lot of these cases about rural communities that might have part-time staff members or might have a planning department of one. And so the capacity issue is very real. And while we hope that while we're there for those 12 months, we're able to help them get coordinated and identify resources and kind of build that momentum, in the absence of the resources that the raft brings, sometimes they do run into some some stumbling blocks. I will say though that what um, I am very pleased to see in coastal Virginia is that a lot more of our localities are either in the works or have resilience plans um, that will help guide their work into the future. Ah, uh, so you're planting the seeds of resilience here with this program. We're planting the seed. And I think more importantly, we're trying to show that it's doable, that it doesn't that you don't need a million dollars to build a seawall, but that right. some of it is very small changes like improving preparedness for hazards or, you know, in, in some communities, while they are very concerned about flooding, the concern about flooding becomes more real because it blocks access to medical facilities. Mm -hmm. So how, so those are these are things that. It might just take not might just it might take some coordination with other entities to address the problem. Um, so there are small things that we can do, but obviously there are also bigger things that need to be done that might hold some of these communities back. I'm with you on that. It goes way beyond just building seawalls, like you said. And speaking of seawalls and infrastructure, you know as well as I do, the American Society for Civil Engineers recently gave this country a C minus rating for infrastructure. That's U.S. infrastructure, C minus. You actually wrote about this back in 2019. And back then we actually had a rating of D plus. It was it was lower yes. back then, but we've moved up a little bit. Tell me, uh, because this is one of your areas of expertise. Uh, what changed since then? And also, what can you tell us about the Highway Trust Fund? So I think. So first of all, I teach a master's level course in transportation policy and planning, and I make my students read the ASCE report on infrastructure in America every year. 
And I asked them to give me what they would if they were to grade our infrastructure. I asked them to give me an assessment. And it's very, it's very consistent. Um, I think what has changed um, over time has been a greater focus on maintenance than new construction. For the longest time, and we still do have that mentality, does, still does exist here in Hampton Roads. We are expanding the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel um, to accommodate more, more traffic. But a lot of our approaches to transportation has been, if you build it, they will come. Rather than thinking about how do you improve the quality and how do you manage congestion in a better way. Uh, so I think some of so, so in the spirit of new construction, uh, that push towards new construction has meant that it's been there had been less funding for maintenance. And deferred maintenance in and of itself becomes a problem. Right. You think about a small pothole. That goes. Unfixed becomes a bigger pothole and a bigger pothole and an even bigger pothole. And the cost to repair it also significantly grows as the problem gets overlooked. So you can see kind of the parallel with maintenance, the lack of maintenance, the and then the, the impacts of that deferred maintenance. So I think we've done a better job. Uh, we saw across different states where they were now putting in place more metrics to measure their commitment to maintenance, for example, um, and having uh, m measurements that they would regularly report on maintenance for, for roads. So we're seeing that they may be a little bit more of that change in the mentality. Um, but you asked about the Highway Trust Fund. The, the issue with the Highway Trust Fund and the issue with a lot of our infrastructure is funding, money. And um, in a lot of states, we have the gas tax that you pay. It's often invisible because when you go to the gas station and you pump your gas, you pay, say, $3.59 and 0.9, 9, right? right? I'm not quite sure why you always have that 0.9 there. But say you pay $3.59, embedded within that $3.59 is a gas tax. Um, and in some states, they also have a local gas tax. So the gas tax also applies at the federal level and funding from the gas tax at the federal level is what goes into the highway trust fund. But at the state level in most states and at the federal level, if you want to increase the gas tax, you have to do it through legislation. It has to be, you have to have legislative approval to increase those gas taxes. And nobody wants to increase taxes and nobody wants to be the legislator that tells their people, yes, I voted to increase the gas tax by five cents. Um, <laughs> so, so therein lies the challenges of there's a resistance to having to legislatively increase your gas taxes over time. But we all know that, and, and you know, my, my, my dad used to tell us stories about how, you know, well, when I was young, you could buy a burger for 55 cents and now the burger is $8. It's the same thing. If you paid gas tax of 10 cents five years ago, that 10 cents today buys very little amount compared to what you get for 10 cents five years ago. So the purchasing power of the gas tax declines over time when it's not raised legislatively. So at the federal level, we haven't increased the gas tax in a while. Um, and I don't anticipate that we'll be, we will be increasing the gas tax um, in a while. And so that is what is leading to a decline in the highway trust fund is that we don't we're not raising enough money to meet the needs for our highway system, our interstate system. And it definitely is a compounding problem. I love how you mentioned that. I'm I'm reminded of the former governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He uh, he took money out of his own pocketbook to pay for a, a pothole repair network. And he was spending a lot of money to help his local community fill in these, these horrible potholes. And it seems like this, the money for these repairs, it's just not there. And I would love to hear your opinion, Wei, on how we can 
you know, get our highways and roads where they need to be in, in 2024. I mean, is there a way to get back to the golden era of American transportation or is that ship sailed? So my answer is very politically not correct. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Let's talk uh, about because it. Because my answer. So I, I think there are several ways to answer that question. One is to go the route of public private partnerships. And we've seen in a lot of states, and Virginia is one of the leading states for using public-private partnerships. We've seen them in Texas and California. But the idea is that your public sector partner, a state Department of Transportation, for example, will partner with the private sector, and the private sector will develop the highway infrastructure and charge a fee. The fee manifests as tolls. And like I said, tolls are not politically correct. <laughs> oh, oh boy, are they are they definitely um, they definitely so, are not? But again, because the private sector is building the road, they're taking on the risk of that construction, of putting up the money up front to build, and they're recouping it, it through the tolls. Um, so that's so that's one possibility when we're talking about big, large scale infrastructure. The challenge is if you're trying to entice a private sector to be part of the solution, they're not going to want to do this for a five year deal. So a lot of the public private partnership projects that you're going to see across this country are 75 year projects, 99 year projects. Um, and and that causes some heartburn for for some people. That's a century long um, project. But in, <laughs> they are. Um, but again, you know, the idea is you invest a lot of it up front and you recuperate, you recoup the costs over time. Mm. Um, similarly, another idea that I know people are not, uh, again, people are not particularly uh, big fans of is the gas tax. And in all honesty, the gas tax is actually a very efficient way uh, to collect to raise revenue for transportation in some ways. You know, so in general, when you think about it, the gas tax is on a per gallon basis, right? And generally bigger vehicles like my truck are gas guzzlers. So you will have to pay more in gas taxes, but because it's a bigger vehicle, you're putting more damage on the road. So there is some proportionality there. But also, the more you use the roads, the more you drive, the more you consume fuel, the more gas taxes you would pay. Again, there's proportionality there. Hmm. But we're kind of going into this time where you have a lot of electric vehicles where their gas consumption does not match with their mileage on the roads. Hmm. And, and so what they're paying in gas taxes is not commensurate with the impact that they're putting on the roads or the damage to the pavement and the surface that they're putting on the roads. Um, so in, in, in some ways, the gas tax could be an, a higher gas tax to better reflect um, some of my earlier research shows that our increases in the gas tax have not even kept pace with inflation, let alone the increase in construction costs, right? So if you can't keep pace, you're con going to constantly be building smaller and smaller with the same pot of money. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are different po po potential solutions that work in combination. I don't know that there's just one uh, magic solution. That's good. It's a complex problem, but I love what you said, you know, investing longer term, because I think the bottom line is you get what you put in, in, in all walks of life. You get what you put in. And if you don't go too far, you'll never go far enough. So maybe a longer term, decades long investment pr process might be worth considering to, to get us out of the woods here. And maybe also, you know, we're talking about electric cars and and rail systems. In fact, you actually uh, you actually wrote extensively about rail and the connection between uh, cities with rail systems and educated young people. Uh, we tell me if, it, what are the chances we're ever going to see a, a high speed train system in the U.S. like like what they have in Asia? Considering that the bulk of the rail infrastructure in this country is privately owned and maintained to different consistent different standards, the lack of consistency across some of those, I think, could be challenging uh, for high speed rail because of the needed infrastructure. 
Uh, I wouldn't put it off because I think I'm always the optimist and I would love to see high speed rail. Yeah. Um, but I think the investment in the infra- the upfront investment in the infrastructure and kind of given that the bulk of our rail system in the country is used to transport goods, not people. Uh, requires that I think you invest in a parallel system to allow for that high speed rail in a way that will not impede the movement of goods. So, yeah, always the technology, I think there's the technology is already there. The question is, can is it worth the investment to see what, that people would actually use it? Um, I think unlike Asia and Europe, we're just not a culture where people use the train regularly and rely on the train regularly. And that's actually what uh, the book chapter that we worked on was really looking at kind of the populations that use different modes of transportation, including light rail, as opposed to other modes of, of transportation. And it very much, I think, is in a sense, kind of a demographic. And so when I do research on public transportation, um, in, in a lot of urban cities, such as here in, in Norfolk, the population that rides the bus is very different from the population that rides the li- that that will ride the light rail transit system. And that what that means then is that where the different pu- public transportation systems connect depend on that demographic. Sounds like a bit of analysis is needed here to make sure it's a, a, a viable option. I like that. And Talk, speaking about analyses, I actually want to go way, way, way back in time here. Oh. Let me set the stage for you. It's the late 90s, and you are what? taking an undergrad class on fluid mechanics. Yes. Your, your professor says that decisions made based on bad data or bad analysis could cause a reactor to blow up. We, what can you tell us about this analogy and chemical engineering and how all of this shaped your career? I'll give you an even better analogy. So again, also a fluid mechanics, a fluid dynamics class. I think it was probably our first fluid, uh, fluid dynamics class. And the assignment was to design a wind turbine to generate a certain amount of power. And I, I, at this point, I was probably a sophomore. So, you know, I really did not know much of the real world. Um, and the, there was a big lesson here. And but he kind of gave us free reign. Make all the assumptions that you want. So, you know, I took it upon myself to make a few assumptions, such as the wind speed was going to be 35 miles per hour for this wind turbine in a big city outside of a hurricane season. <laughs> Um, and so we all designed and he and at the end of the day, he did not care about what our design actually looked like. What he cared about was what were the assumptions that you made? And so my assumption of 35 mile per hour wind that would be regularly gusting for this wind turbine to produce the energy that is required was not at all realistic, right? <laughs> If we had regular 35 mile per hour winds, I would be in a different business completely. Um, But it was a fundamental, I think, reminder of how the assumptions that we make shape the outcome, shape what we produce and the decisions that we make. And that is something that I've carried with me continuously. I'm always kind of asking, what are the assumptions that I'm making here? Um, It's the same thing with a reactor and kind of the a bad, not just bad data, but bad assumptions that produce that data can produce a very unfavorable outcome. Um, and, and so I think for me, it's always just been what are the assumptions that I'm bringing to the table or what are the assumptions that other people are operating under um, that are getting, you know, that are getting us to this particular decision point. And so when I teach doctoral students, that's the first thing that I teach them when they're reviewing journal articles. What is the assumption that these authors are making? Um, So, yes. 
I learned that lesson very early on. <laughs> this is so fascinating. We the psychologists often call this reality testing, and they 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 want you to consider through through what lens are you viewing reality? And is is that lens uh, is the color of that stable? Is it accurate? And it seems like you learned the lesson early on, which has really helped you out during your career. That was that was back in in, in Notre Dame, and mm -hmm. you got your PhD at the University of Kentucky. Yes. And, and your dissertation, it was it was the effectiveness of entrepreneurial startup assistance programs. And actually, many years later, you uh, you raised nine million dollars for a startup incubator. Uh, tell us, what is the effectiveness of entrepreneurial startup assistance programs? So I will this my dissertation research actually had three different parts and three different essays. But at the end of the day, the mm -hmm. big lesson that came out of it is that entrepreneurs that went to startup assistance programs came out saying that they did not always get what they thought they needed. So basically the research asked them, you went to a startup assistance program for help with your startup, with your business. And then they asked, what did you want? And what did you get out of that? The assistance program, was it helpful? And a vil, only a very small percentage of the entrepreneurs said that what they got, what they wanted and what they got actually matched. And this kind of piqued my interest because as part of working with this nonprofit uh, technology incubator, one of the programs that we had was a program that, called, what, that was called Listening to Your Business. And it was fundamentally about an assessment of what your business needed. But the entrepreneurs going into an assistance program, a lot of them would say, rightfully so, I need money. But a lot of them did not come out of the assistance program with money. Because oh. money is the end point, right? And you need to have a business plan. You need to have financial statements. You need to have a market analysis. All of these are stepping stones to getting you to the end goal of maybe a venture capitalist or an angel investor or getting a big bank loan. And so the entrepreneurs that say they came in and they wanted money, but they came out with a business plan. Right. That's a mismatch of what they wanted and what they got. But it doesn't mean that it was unsuccessful. It doesn't mean that it was not effective. What it fundamentally indicated to me was that an important process was taking place through something like listening to your business or this assessment that helps do, that help these entrepreneurs get from this is what I want to this is what I need. And then coming out of this program with what they need. And, and so sometimes you are in situations where you don't know what you don't know. And I kind of equate these entrepreneurs in this situation with those who they might know, all they know is that they need money for their business to be sustained, but they don't know what it takes to get that money. And so working with those startup assistance programs over time, or even in the short term might produce something that's much more tangible, that can be a launching point for getting what they thought they needed, which was money. Now, with that in mind, we let me ask you, what's an entrepreneur to do if they're just starting out? What advice would you give them? Should they go after the bag? I mean, uh, what what are we looking at here if you're just starting out? I think when you're just starting out, the key point is to be realistic and to actually not assume that you know what your customers want or what your clients want. And I actually see that in the research that we do. So I work with Josh Baer, who is another colleague here at ODU in our Virginia Modeling Analysis and Simulation Center. And he works with his team on um, housing disaster post -rec housing disaster recovery, right? And one of the big things that he and his team have done over the, the last few years is, is as they're working on kind of a tool to help manage the resource flow um, that comes in to help with housing recovery is first trying to figure out what it is that people need. And, and so they've done a lot of iterative discussions with nonprofit organizations that support uh, residents who are displaced or people who um, have 
uh, houses or homes that are damaged. They work with the local, uh, they've done um, conversations and discussions with local governments that are trying to get these people back into their homes with the state department, uh, VDEM, the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. And, and so all of these conversations kind of predated the actual development of the tool, right? Because you can't design a tool without knowing who, why people want it, how people will use it, what is the what is the gap that's being addressed? And so it's been a protracted process. While we don't necessarily have the perfect tool or the tool that we went into the process thinking we needed, um, through that iterative conversation with the equivalent of clients or customers, you're getting an understanding of what are the challenges that they're facing on the ground. And so Josh has gone out and he's talked to VOADs, he's talked to other types of nonprofit support organizations, he's talked to advocacy groups, he's talked to church groups, he he's talked to our you know housing development agencies, just trying to get a better idea. If something happens and a person is has a home that is damaged or is needs to be repaired, what are the stumbling blocks that they're running into? And how can a tool that we would put a lot of resources and effort into developing actually truly try and address some facets of that problem rather than potentially addressing a problem that we imagine is, is going on out there, right? Because as we do our research, and I do this sometimes too, don't get me wrong, you start reading the literature and you look at this study and that study and you go, I know what the problem is. But until you actually go out and talk to people who would actually use what it is that you're going to develop, what you know or what you think you know might be very different. And and, and so I, I see that same thing with entrepreneurs. I might have this great idea. Uh, I actually worked with an entrepreneur when I was with this technology incubator, and it was great. He had this idea for heated wiper blades. Because if, you, if you've ever been caught in an ice storm, uh -huh. Uh -huh. those heated wiper blades could be amazing, right? Yeah, or just getting your car out of that block of ice <laughs> in the morning, yeah. But, but as we were doing kind of this market research, he was basing his market research and how, pro how profitable his product would be based on every single driver in the U.S., including those in Florida who probably wouldn't fork up the difference or those in Texas or Alabama. Um, and, and so being more realistic about, well, who would actually use this heated wiper blade was a big question that I kept asking him over and over. And let's finesse this geography of where you would target your products. Um, and, and so I think in, in the same way, when we do that research, it's, you know, you have to finesse it and figure out how can it be truly be useful. And at the end of the day, I go back to accessible. A lot of my work is about accessibility understandability relevance usability i really that really speaks to me so thinking about people's needs in a holistic fashion forgetting the bureaucracy forgetting your preconceived notions of what you think people want think about the actual needs and then work backwards from there so you can really hit that target don't just it's it's wonderful to create for the sake of creating but you want your you want to get some results here and to do that you got to understand the market and understand market forces and and what uh, what people really want, uh, boy. I love this topic. We could talk about this for the entire podcast, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, bring up another topic here. Going back to Kentucky, I want to actually drop uh, three very big names that you might know. What can you tell us about Dwight Dennison, Merrill Hackbart, and Linehan O'Connell? Uh, so three amazing co-authors. Um, Dwight passed um, last year, but he um, was also a Kentucky alum. And uh, we've kind of between the, the three of us have done quite a bit of work on transportation related finance issues and just public finance issues in in general. I think I also learned to be how to be a great mentor to graduate students by being around people like Merle and like uh, Dwight and thinking about how to nurture that next generation of graduate students. And so another stream of research that I do, of course, because I have all the time on my hands, um, I do, I work, 
I work on um, providing professional and career development to graduate students. Um, it's something that I do because I felt like I received a lot of that type of coaching as a graduate student myself. And I want to return that favor and give back to the next generation of scholars and uh, PhDs and, and researchers. And so I run at the university at ODU, I run the Career Pathways Program, and it's a university-wide career and professional development program um, with the goal of providing our graduate students with the resources to help them explore careers and plan for those careers. And one of the things that I always teach students or I talk to my students about is find yourself a great mentor. And a lot of times it's plural mentors because yeah, these are going to be the people that you go talk to that will give you guidance. Um, and that was what Merle was for me. And I continue to try to be that for my graduate students. And this is an amazing week for me because just on Monday, um, I had one of my doctoral students defend her dissertation, and that looked at context and trust when it comes to hazard preparedness for coastal community, coastal households. Um, and I have another graduate student, another doctoral student, who will be defending her dissertation on Friday. And there she's looking at the problem of marine debris and kind of the confluence of stakeholder perspectives and how we tell the story about marine debris. So different facets of coastal resilience. But again, uh, my role is to support uh, the growth and these professional, the professional development of these doctoral students and future PhDs. And, and Dr. Yusuf, you are no stranger to helping students. I mean, you've done this so much for the CRC as well with all the summer research programs. Tell us a bit about how summer research works through CRC and how you in enthusiastically played a role in bringing all this good fortune to our students. So our first, uh, so with the CRC, we first of all, um, we've been able to bring students here to uh, ODU. And so we've actually been very lucky to uh, partner with Tougaloo College and uh, Laiju and her students to host them here on campus. And the first student that we actually hosted um, was a student from Tugalu, um, and it was an amazing experience because I think not only did was I able to kind of help him think about his project that he wanted to pursue for his grad for his undergraduate program, but um, it was a very busy summer, and so we took him to meetings where. You know, we were talking about challenges in coastal resilience. And I remember we were in a conversation uh, where people were pitching different ideas for how we were going to solve a variety of different coastal problems. And one problem that came up was this idea that we had all of these old boats that could be converted into dorms. Um, and just, and like, for example, at ODU, we have our sailing center. We could park a boat and make it a dorm. And uh, Deshaun's eyes just kind of got big <laughs> as he thought about the possibilities. And so um, I, I really enjoy having them come to campus, giving them a different environment to experience. Um, to kind of get and do some of the the research and be part of our research team. But I'm a big believer in graduate education. And so I also had Deshaun sit down with some of our graduate students so they could share their experiences um, with him as well. So at least put some, you know, just some teasers out there about, you know, yeah, undergraduate degree, good to go. But think about graduate school and think about those possibilities as well. So I think those programs are great because it allows the undergraduate students to explore their horizons and, and, and you know, go off to a different um, university, for example, and learn about research from different faculty than what they would have at their home institution. But it's always a learning experience both ways. Because I don't work with a lot of undergraduate students, so I love seeing kind of the wonder and answering questions and trying to encourage them to think about think about research in a way that I don't generally get to do here at ODU because I work mostly with graduate students. And the enthusiasm that you have for helping students, it is contagious. Let me tell you, it's you're in this pantheon with other investigators like Dr. Ismail Pagan Trinidad and Dr. Merun Elijah, Elijah, 
mm-hmm. helping students. We did a great episode with Dr. Pagan from the dad and uh, CRC, of course, is helping uh, New York, uh, New York City Tech and other MSI schools. It's so wonderful that we're all in a position to do this, because like you said, this students are the future. That's the bottom line. We, we are we are giving them. Uh, the tools they need to help solve the problems that we're all working on right now. And uh, hopefully that future is going to be very bright. Thanks to the efforts we're putting in here. Uh, but talking about the future, I actually want to jump forward into it by a, by a huge margin. I think you can actually help me with this. What can you tell us about the blue line project? So the Blue Line project is a project that my colleague Tom Allen um, has been kind of spearheading for several years now. And I think it really relies on this idea that if you can help people visualize the impact of flooding and visualize um, kind of what it would look like into the future, it helps people understand a little bit more the severity of it. And so, for example, in the first year, um, of the Blue Line project, uh, Tom picked different sites around Norfolk and he and his students. And so this, again, talking about bringing students into the process um, in a class that he was teaching, he had students model sea level rise for different scenarios. And then they got out this blue chalk and blue tape and they went to the sailing center on the Odeo campus and based on their models, marked up where the tide would be where the water would be in 2050, 2080, and 2100. So they have these, they painted these blue lines on this, on, on this, along the sailing center. Um, so people could visualize where the water would be when, what, you know, based on those projections. So the students got to do the projections and then they got to actually visualize where it was on the ground. Um, we have a great, we have an amazing museum, the Chrysler Museum here. Um, in Norfolk, but it's in a very vulnerable area and um, water laps up to the entrance of the museum on some days. And so he also picked that the Chrysler Museum as another site where they use blue chalk to show where the water would be going into uh, the entrance to, to the museum. Again, picking a site where a lot of people are familiar with um, and making them more familiar with what it would look like in 2100, for example, if water were up to this this blue line. So again, it's that power of visualization. And um, it's also, I think, a way to help students also engage with, I'm not just doing this in the classroom because Dr. Allen says I'm supposed to do it for my class assignment, but really then translating that to, oh, but this is what it will look like on the ground. Um, so it's a great educational approach to thinking about applied learning but then a communicative and visual impact um, when you build it also around more of an engagement activity. I'm with you on that. I, this is why I loved reading about this project, because seeing really is believing. And sometimes we need to see to believe and having that visual representation, of that line and, and the idea that this line is where the water might be in 2100, the next century. I love that. I'm, I'm reminded of a rock that I saw in a German town, it was very high in the mountains, but the rock said it, 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 at this time in, in 16, whenever the lake rose to this level and you think, wow, that's, it, it doesn't look like it would go that high, but sure enough, it did. So uh, it helps you suspend your disbelief when you can actually see the effects of these things. Big fan of that. Uh, I want to shift gears just a little bit here, going back to your, your folks that you work with in Kentucky before you actually met all those people. You may have been somewhere else. And I want to mention the name of a place that you probably know. Longkawi, Malaysia. Does Longkawi, Malaysia mean anything to you? So actually, I'm originally from Malaysia. um, But my parents live on the Borneo Island. We were just in Malaysia two years ago. And we actually um, took vacation in, in Longkawi and you know, we live here in, in Norfolk close to the beach, but we're beach people. We love the beach. And so anywhere we go, we try to go to the beach. And Langkawi is an amazing beach um, in, in Malaysia. We're going home uh, this summer. And my husband's like, I would like to go back to Langkawi. He's like, OK, I love the beach. We can do the beach. Very much beach, beach people. 
I'd say you're yeah, like I, I'm, I remember I'm originally from from Malaysia and kind of made the transition to to the U.S. to go to school at Notre Dame. It, it seems it, it's so beautiful. I mean, talking about the beaches. Wow. Every picture just seems like it belongs on a magazine cover. <laughs> <laughs> I have never been maybe one day. Um, maybe we can do a project out there at some point. Wouldn't that be <laughs> wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, uh, speaking of uh, uh, Lon Cowie and all this stuff. I have it and 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 beach sports. Yes. I have it on very good authority that you are quite the volleyball supporter. What can you tell I us am. we <laughs> about Lakewood volleyball? So um my husband was a coach. My husband is, take it back, my husband is a volleyball coach. Uh, my son is a volleyball player. So I am very much a volleyball coach's wife, volleyball, and a volleyball mom. mom and a volleyball supporter extraordinaire um so but my husband um was the coach at um lakewood academy for discovery um and my son played uh for my husband as a player and he's now at maury high school and he is playing for maury high school's volleyball volleyball team Ooh, fantastic it's a great sport yeah. it's, a, and, and it's a great sport indoor sports but also beach volleyball and i think that's where where we live we just kind of gravitate more towards beach volleyball and my son plays beach volleyball year round and being in the norfolk area you can do that a lot, a lot of great places yes. in the tidewater to to do that and, and speaking of norfolk i know we got some listeners from virginia let's let's hash out let's hash out the best bakery is is nas bakery we the best bakery in norfolk Nas has the best donuts ever. Donuts the size of saucers. The, I was They're tipped amazing. off. I yes. was tipped off that you might be a strong supporter of Nas Bakery. <laughs> so I did some investigating of my own. And good Lord, uh, you are not kidding about those donuts. They look so good. I wish I could get some of those down here in Chapel Hill because, man, uh, what, a, what a delicious treat. Oh, man. Yes. <laughs> And uh, uh, talking about actually heroes, uh, there's one that people tell me you're very fond of. We, what's the deal with Jack Reacher? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of the Jack Reacher series, not the original Jack Reacher movies, because um, Tom Cruise is not Jack Reacher. See, I was going to ask who who played him better, Tom Cruise or Alan Richardson? Alan Richardson, for sure. Uh, my my son uh, jokes about it as all the time because he's read some of the Jack Reacher books and he's read some of the uh, covers, the back covers where it talks about Jack Reacher, you know, his hand is the size of dinner plates and his fist is the size of a whole chicken. Um, and that is not Tom Cruise. I'm just saying. <laughs> it, it's true. I'm a big fan of Tom Cruise, but uh, there's a, a difference of stature there. I, I would agree yes, with you. Yeah, very much so. Uh, well, I know we're coming up on time here. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to keep any longer than I have to. But let's before we go. Let's let's get down to brass tacks here. I want to do this because we've got an expert here on the show, and by golly, the people just need to know what is the genuine outlook here on sea level rise. Where are we going, and what should we do about it? So I'm not a big believer in doom and gloom. Sea level rise is happening. It will continue. The waters will continue to rise, even if we stop emissions and all of the things that are contributing to the heat and sea level rise. There's just enough trapped heat that we will have sea level rise continue, even if we stop what we're doing now. It's inevitable, but I also believe in agency. I also believe in being proactive. And I think um, a few years ago, our struggle was recognizing that sea level rise was real. There are still scenarios where I will go out and talk to people on the eastern shore or in the northern neck of Virginia, and they will say it's not sea level rise, it's coastal erosion. And I will be perfectly fine saying, yes, coastal erosion is a problem. And if we recognize it as a problem, what do we do about coastal erosion or what do we do about sea level rise? Um, I think we've come a long way from putting our heads our, our, our heads in the sand and saying it's not a problem. I think there is general recognition of the problem, regardless of how we want what we want to call it. 
because there are still parts where we still say recurrent flooding because we don't want to say sea level rise. Um, so I think the problem is real, but you know we have weathered a variety of challenges over the years. As human beings, we are resilient. The question becomes, what is our willingness to do something about, about the problem? And, and so I think that willingness, whether it is willingness to pay, if we want to build a seawall, somebody has to pay. If we're going to raise the road, somebody will have to pay. Whether it's our willingness to pay or if it's our willingness to change our behavior or, or willingness to adapt our property, I think that is where agency and that is where the resilience of human beings come into play. Mm. And where do the feds come into this? Because as you know, DHS does fund the show. We don't speak for them, but they do fund us. Uh, you've advised governments before, Virginia and Kentucky. Are they taking your advice? And If yes, to what extent? If no, why not? I don't generally give advice as much as I kind of consult and provide input on planning and documents right um and and so but i but i will say that i think there is an openness for the most part for government to incorporate research findings into how they might change their policies or how they might make to make their decisions but i think as researchers um and as receivers of that from, for example, a federal agency, we need to work better at making the connection between the research and how it can inform decision making or policies or practices. And, and that's not and that's kind of hard because that's not something that I teach in a PhD program. I don't teach my students how to do that kind of work. And at the same time, I, we don't necessarily teach you know, federal government staff how to engage with researchers in a way that can do that productively and, and efficiently. So I think I think there's interest in them to be receiving that information. And we see that with the CRC and how some of the, you know, the work with ADSERP, for example, is impacting decision making. So I don't think it can't be done. I think there's an openness on both ends. Um, I don't know that we necessarily do it well. Um, that could be something that we could that we could be improving over time. I think we're taking steps in the right direction, at least this stuff definitely transcends academia. It, it transcends almost everything. But as long as we're working together and we have the right values and the right mindset, I think we're going to make it. I think we can help everybody in the process. We it has been wonderful to talk to you today. Do you have anything that you want to tell the people? out there before we wrap up? No, other than read the book, Climate Change, Communication, Making Environmental Messaging Accessible. I get royalties. <laughs> Happy to plug that book for you. We, we will certainly plug that book. Link in the description. Check that out. Um, and hopefully you and I can do some more crosstalk. The Equity Workshop, yeah. uh, the Equity Workshop media package will be dropping soon. So uh, let's actually talk very soon. We thank you for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. It was my pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, we got, oh, we, we, thank you, Dr. Yusuf. Really appreciate you. Uh, we've got plenty more uh, content coming up. But until then, to our fantastic listeners, check out our website, coastalresiliencecenter.org. Follow all of our Twitter and social feeds through Linktree. That's Linktree slash Coastal Resilience. Thank you so much for tuning in. Another fantastic episode. We are always, always so very thrilled to be seeing you Shoreside. Much more to come, but for now, Bruce Rosenblum signing out from Shoreside. We'll see you real soon.